Um, can people hear me okay in the back? Good. Um, yeah, I've, I've been to these events before, but I've never seen it this crowded. Uh, so it's really good. Um, and my talk is going to be not super technical because it's like everyone wants to have a beer and a bit of pizza. So I'm going to keep it nice and short and fairly non technical because there's a lot of different people in the audience from different various backgrounds. Uh, so before we kick off, uh, I want to start with, with asking people how many has heard of the dark net? Raise that. Okay, how many has been on the dark net? Okay, maybe a, a fifth of the audience. But so that's a good start um, because some, sometimes you do sometimes you do these talks and no one has actually been in on there. Um, so then I know a bit well what level I can be on. Um, so let's see. <coughs> now something. Okay, <laughs> wow. So uh, I'm going to start with a bit of introduction on myself. Um, my name is Thomas Olsen. Um, I'm the founder of uh, Intelliag, and we do darknet monitoring, and we've been doing that for quite a few years. We started this project um, four or five years ago where we found, because we're doing, like I actively do, my background is penetration testing and hacking, um, and then I went into risk management for big companies, and when it came to, uh, like, I, and, and I worked for a couple of really large banks, and they were like, what's our hacking risk? It's like everyone's like, I think we have uh, a risk that is, basically there was no threat intelligence. No one actually had any reasonable uh, intelligence on what were the threats online. So we started that. Uh, on top of that, I'm also uh, one of the core organizer and the founder of secti.org, which is a hacking conference in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, we're this year running in, in September, where we have a lot of international speakers from around the world. Uh, a great community. So if you want to talk, uh, please submit to sect.org. Uh, my other interest, except for that, um, I've been working with secure software development from a very long time ago. So I was like people who ask for like senior software developer, super senior, but I call myself an ancient software developer. Uh, so so and, and I've been working with like security in software development uh, for a very long time. Um, so that's my background. Um, my other interest currently is, is crypto, and then I don't mean like trading in Bitcoin, I uh, mean actually cryptographic algorithms, uh, and also working a bit with that when it comes to cryptography in cryptocurrencies, for instance, and blockchain. Uh, but today, we are. this talk is called The Dark Side of the Moon, uh, which is, if you know this, picture, it's a old Pink Floyd album, and it's called The Dark Side of the Moon. And I think this image actually really nicely um, puts an image to what the darknet is. Because basically, you have something where you can go in through the prism, and yes, you can do stuff on the other side of the prism, but it's very many different things for different people, the darknet. And that's what, what it comes out. Uh, because you have this and, and me and together with Eric for Intelliag, Eric Michaud, a couple of years ago, did a research because we found a vulnerability in the Tor browser where we actually mapped all of the sites that were on the darknet continuously. We got a feed of all the sites as they came up. Uh, and we found so much interesting stuff. Uh, <laughs> and, and the darknet is, is, there's a lot of misconceptions and there is a lot of stuff that isn't what you think it is. Um, so that's why I think it's most fascinating with, with researching darknet is that the amount of weird stuff that you see. Uh, some of our analysts that I had employed on this, they, they had to see a lot of really, really scary stuff, uh, really criminal stuff, but also a lot of, of good laughs and stuff that you found on darknet. Because if you can look at every page from the darknet, you're gonna, like, there is things that you cannot unsee. <laughs> I hope I can't put them in the slide deck, uh, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Uh, but we had a lot of fun. Um, so defining, first of all, there is a lot of misconceptions of the darknet uh, because the, everyone has a picture because it's a very cool buzzword, the darknet. It, it's like 
ninja black. It's something that speaks to everyone. Uh, so there is a lot of misconception about what it actually is. And one of the biggest misconceptions comes from a media article about eight years ago about the deep web. It's like someone's like, oh, I heard the dark net is 200 million times bigger than the open internet. Well, we did our research, it's like, it's actually only 13,000 active sites, and that's really, 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 really small. It's a promille. Uh, this image, which says it's 6%, is totally off. It's like more of six promille. Um, so the reality, there's a lot of myths to debunk. It's very, very small, um, and the confusion was the deep web, because that was a journalist haven't written down the source, and I can't remember his name, that said the deep web is defined as everything that not indexed by Google. So all your internal servers at all your companies. And then the open web would be 4% of all the data available. But the darknet is even, even smaller, and it's a minuscule amount of data uh, compared to uh, the open web. Um, and basically what defines it as being dark is that you need, it, you can't see what, what other people are doing. It's like, it's heavily encrypted. And it's, we're going to go into that a bit more, not too technical. Um, but it's not dark as, as you think it's dark. It's like, if you post something on the dark web, I can see it. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask a question. Tell me the first thing that comes to mind when, when you hear darkness. Drugs. Drugs. Guns. 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 Hitman. Guns, drugs, hitman. Exactly. <laughs> that, that's what we'll think there. The numbers, like when we did this research, it was very funny because there was a lot of stuff on the dark web like that's not in the media. Uh, most of the stuff they found was actually <laughs> My Little Ponies. A lot of My Little Ponies. Really, really bad. hundreds of sites of, of Brunies. Uh, because maybe that's something that you don't want to do like in public, uh, admit that you're actually a, really a Brunie and they like turned on by li My Little Ponies. Uh, so there was a lot of, of Brunie sites that we knew. We didn't have a category like Brunie. <laughs> so classifying new sites that popped up on the dark net. Uh, so maybe that's not the first thing that you would think about when, when you come to dark net, but that's the first thing we found in loads of them. Uh, and there's some other more disturbing stuff that you're like, hmm, I don't know what it is. It, it's not probably not illegal because it's animated. Uh, but there's a bit, very big furry community. Uh, furries, they are turned on by furry animals. Uh, so there's a lot of furry sites as well, uh, which is also interesting, but not very criminal or, or not something we need to monitor uh, for like our corporate security. Um, luckily. And then we have the drugs, uh, and everyone knows about the drug trading. And that's where basically the internet took off with Darknet when the, the drug, when, when Silk Road took off, basically. That's when everyone realized that. Ooh, I can buy cheap cocaine on the internet. How do I do that? <laughs> and that's how every, every, most people learned because then the, the media articles took off, uh, basically. And that was a big bump in the number of sites and also a very big bump in the Bitcoin price. Bitcoin price is like correlates exactly against these articles. The first articles was like, how do I get WikiLeaks money? Then Bitcoin took off the first price increase. Second is like, how do I buy cocaine on the dark net? And that was the second big boost for, for the Bitcoin price. Um, but then, of course, we don't only have these guys. We have the other usual suspects that we normally monitor. Uh, and when it comes to security and cybercrime, uh, there, there is a lot of people that, that we like to watch more closely than the furry side. Um, so how did we get here? Well, basically, the reason why Darknet became so big in cybercrime is obviously there were Darknets before Tor. The Tor really was the one that took it off, made it take off. And Tor has an interesting history because it was actually funded by DARPA originally, the original research. Um, so it's an American-sponsored program that was intended to be 
not anonymous, but be hard to geolocate. So you can have agents aboard, abroad, especially for the US Navy, that would actually submit information back home, but they don't want to be tracked when they're abroad, at least not geolocated. Um, so that's one of the, the original, sorry? You have a comment? No, 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 I just thought. Yeah, I, you said that there were obviously four. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, the, the, there are other um, darknets before Tor, um, but normally smaller communities, everything from uh, VPN communities uh, and also the free net uh, was existing before. So basically, there were other encryption layers before uh, Tor protocol came into, and Freenet is probably the biggest one, um, and there's ITP, etc. But the tour really made it take off, uh, and the perfect storm was because tour also added the ability which is called hidden services. So you not only could discuss or message, you could also run web services which couldn't be located. Okay, but that's all well and good. They can do, it's like, if you want to sell stolen accounts or drugs or Hitman services, it's not enough that you just can run a website that's not. You also need the payment method. And basically at the same time, Bitcoin happened uh, on a big scale. Um, so it's the emerging technology of both the Tor network and the Bitcoin payments that made it possible not only to run a website, but actually monetize the website anonymously. Okay, maybe it's not totally anonymously, but it, it's sort of anonymously. Um, so this made the perfect storm for law enforcement uh, because at Intellia we have been running these like courses for private companies and law enforcement agencies like how do you investigate darknet because it is challenging but it's not impossible. You just basically you were where it's like the internet should be. You shouldn't be able to monitor where everyone does. You just have to do proper good police work and, and actually do it the old school way. You can't just monitor everyone where everyone says and just go pick them up. You actually have to do proper police work. And that's the biggest change uh, with, with uh, darkness. So I think the, it, it's not really a challenge. It's just this is how the internet was supposed to be <laughs> from my perspective. Um, so the usual suspects, who are we watching? Well, obviously we're watching people and stuff that can do harm. Um, and yes, there is guns to buy. Uh, you can buy a lot of guns, um, fairly easy. Um, I thought it was fake, because it's also very <laughs> interesting to know that the cybercrime and physical crimes unit, it's always fraud is the most, pro pro most common threat that you find on the dark net. It's like, it's easier not to sell you cocaine than to sell you cocaine. And there's a lower risk. So on, on most of the sites that you find on Darknet are actually fraud. It's like most of the Hitman services. Mm, my analysis would be, I'd rather just take the money and not kill someone. Because they're, they're not going to be able to track you. So it's like, oh, you gave me the money, half a front for killing someone. I didn't kill them. Ha, ha. You get bad feedback. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're coming to that. Exactly. Because that, that's... That's why you have star ratings nowadays uh, on services. Um, so the big sites, but then there is site. There, then there is like gun running sites that are literally actually working. And and a big problem that we have had in Sweden uh, lately is with unexploded hand grenades, because most of these weapons come from the Balkans, uh, from the wars that be left over. And there is a lot of hand grenades like in surplus. So they actually throw in like free. If you order like an AK-47, they throw in a couple of hand grenades. We have a huge, no, I'm, I'm not kidding, like, we have had a huge problem with like people like drop put in, on the streets in Sweden like throwing hand grenades at each other because like they, you get them for free. And this is actually true since we uh, have now done an, an amnesty for handing in hand grenades. Uh, so you don't get charged if you just hand your hand grenades in. Uh, 
Um, ba basically, there is no escrow services uh, happening. So uh, criminals never trust each other, right? So what, what's happening on the darknet is you have set up escrow services. So you pay the money. The site is, is like a third party independent site. So you, you input your Bitcoin into the site's wallet. When you have received the goods, the site release it and give you a rating. Uh, so it, it's basically, like uh, it, it, yeah, it's like PayPal on eBay, but for very, very different goods. Um, <laughs> and uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, we found a lot of interesting stuff. We were monitoring this. Uh, before the US election, obviously, and one of the th stuff they found was the original guy from not Russia, uh, from Ukraine, I think it was, that sold the original dumb files of the Hillary Clinton emails uh, on, a, on a public auction on one of these sites. It was literally like people who were bidding to buy it. And we got a sample <laughs> because we, we're there with like soft puppet accounts. So we got a sample of some of the emails. So it was like, Holy shit, these are legit. Uh, and that the whole site, like two days later, were gone. <laughs> the whole darkness site was gone. So probably someone else from the US intelligence also bought it, and, or Russian intelligence, I don't know. Someone bought something, uh, and then the whole site was down. Uh, so these sites are fairly short lived. Uh, and I mean, let's see. It's given up on me a little. Um. Right. So, I'm just wondering. Yep. Is your responsibility to lock down the site or lock down the server? Um, my responsibility, we, we, we as monitoring this uh, from an intelligence <coughs> perspective, we don't do any, uh, we, we just let people be aware of a threat. Uh, the question was, what is your responsibility to close down sites? Uh, we don't do anything because that would be active hacking. No, no, I, I don't mean close down the site. I mean, well, with the escrow system, oh. it's almost like a VPN for money transactions. Yeah. Right? So my question is, is uh, when you monitor, are you monitoring the uh, transactor, the person selling the guns? or the actual website that the guns are being transferred through? We, we, uh, the question was, like, do you actually monitor the sellers or, or the market side? We monitor the market side, we don't monitor the sellers. Because it's very hard to pinpoint down uh, who the sellers are. Because one of the things that is true with, with the darknet, it's not dark, you can see what happens. The darknet is not dark, but you can't geolocate it. You can't know where the server is or where the seller is. So that's the, the truth of it. Um, and when I talk about political activists, I'm not saying that we're watching political activists from that perspective, but we are watching terrorist groups and politically motivated uh, activists. And that can be because a lot of, of recruitment has also moved to the darknet. Um, because, like, uh, for instance, ISIS has moved first from public web. Everything that's being closed down, basically, that's the trend, is moving to the darknet. Uh, because it's really hard to close down a site that is on the darknet. So, for instance, a lot of, of the ISIS recruitment went first through like public web to Facebook being closed down there, Telegram groups being closed down there, and now there is recruitment sites on the darknet because they're not closed down yet because it's very hard to do. Um, rogue hackers, obviously, an organized crime. Uh, is the most rogue hackers. You think like, ah, oh, well, that's not a big threat. Most people that well, I was talking about the banks and the risk analysis, they rogue hackers, no, not a big threat. Mm. But what we've seen, especially with the past two years of data dumps, is like rogue hackers is your biggest threat. Really, it is by far much hard, much bigger than nation states. Like most people would say, nation states is the scariest thing that happens. Nowadays, with given the dark net, uh, given the stock prices of some people that have been hacked lately, I would say rogue hackers is your biggest security concern. Um, and then we have organized crime. What we don't find on the darknet is state-sponsored actors, but they're there. Trust me, everyone is monitoring. Like I, I, I guess that every nation state has at least a couple of guys employed that just sit trolling the darknet, because sometimes you might find these things like Hillary Clinton's emails. 
So it, it would be really irresponsible for a nation state not to be on the dark net and monitor everything that happens there. Because it's a really good source of, of intelligence. Um, and then we have disgruntled customers or employees for companies because there is also the doxing site. And doxing site is basically where you paste information of people you don't like uh, publicly. Or not publicly, but sort of publicly. Uh, so that, uh, and it happened to me once. That's why for a long time I didn't use my surname uh, because I got doxed once. And, and ID theft is not that fun. <laughs> it's like my, my credit score was sort of bad, uh, to say the least. And, and it does happen. And, and I mean, especially since we're monitoring people like ISIS and stuff, you don't know, they, you don't want them to know where you live. That's the short bit. Um, so what, what threats do we actually find that is like relevant to, to a corporate security perspective? The most stuff they find is leaked personal data, a lot. Uh, it sells either in bulk or in like uh, uh, PI numbers or personal identifiable data, sells like for a dime nowadays. It's like it's not even worth a dollar uh, unless you have something really useful. But, but you buy them in bulk on some of these trading sites. Hacking attempts, stolen accounts, leaked accounts, um, sometimes zero day exploits, not that much. The, that trade has moved. Thankfully, I, I actually think this is due to the past two years we have had so much um, bug bounty programs that it has actually killed the darknet zero day market, which is a good trend uh, because, like, either you now sell them to nation states and get a lot of money, or you can actually sell them to a bug bounty program and get paid uh, as a white hat hacker, which is an interesting trend because we see that the zero day market has almost died. Um, and the most, one of the most popular thing is like malware and exploit packs that you can buy on the dark net. It's like here you have these, not zero day vulnerabilities, but quite recent vulnerabilities that will still break into 90% of the companies. So <laughs> you, you can make a fair good estimate on, on how that works. So going into some dark net myths, um, this is quite small text, but basically, um, the part of the web that's only accessible by means of special software allowing users and website operators to uh, remain anonymous or untraceable. Um, and this leads to uh, the thing that Darknet is anonymous. And a lot of people don't get this. Darknet is not really anonymous. It's not able, to, it's like having the internet <coughs> without being able to trace your IP. If you if you say I'm Thomas Olufsen, I live here, then you're not anonymous. Just because you're on the dark net. It's not more anonymous than any other website. It's just that they can't trace where your IP lives. So they can't come knock down your door. So it's like yeah. as yeah? You can if you have a first node and last node. Uh, technically, yes, but but then if they own both of the nodes you're sort of screwed. You, you, can, you can set up, but th this is the technical discussion, you can set up how you want to route. You can yeah. route around those nodes. Um, so the, the darknet is not anonymous. And yes, you, you can be quite sure that there is a lot of rude people running nodes uh, and exit nodes. Uh, Tor is working very hard to get away from that, to, to like track down bad nodes and bad actors. But yes, there is a lot like, I would probably say half of the nodes, this is my estimate, is probably run by nation states because it's a really good source of intelligence. Yes? Is it actually a bad node if it's run by a nation state? Because it still routes traffic, right? The, the, so the, you just don't know which nation state it is. The, the point is, is, is it a bad node because it's run by nation states? It still routes traffic. Yes, that is correct. Unless you actually mess with the software, if you only monitor what's happening on the dark net, you will never be detected by Tor. If you start to like inject code uh, and stuff, then Tor will notice you and, and shut you down. But yes, but we would we can probably guess that more than half of the Tor network I is run by nation state actors. But that it's designed to actually be able to handle that because you have to own enough nodes uh, to actually de-anonymize it. So, so it's resilient to those type of attacks. 
which is good. So, so the nation states are giving us free anonymizing proxies. Basically, that's what happened. Um, the second thing is like only criminals use the dark net. Uh, and that's what was like, because some people ask me, oh, you work with the dark net. Isn't that illegal? It's like, no. <laughs> it's like, it's a software. It's not illegal by definition. It's like anyone can run it and it's not illegal to be on the dark net. And most of the stuff, when we did this census a couple of years ago, going through the darkness site, more than half of them were definitely legit. Uh, like, it's not illegal like My Little Ponies, it's just a bit weird. <laughs> like, uh, so, so the majority of traffic is, is definitely legit. Um, and then it's, it's the misconception that almost always law enforcement says like, Oh, the darknet, it, it, it's like, it's impossible, it's destroying our police work. Well, I think that's a myth as well. It's like, no, you just have to do your police work as you're supposed to do your police work. Actually research people and see where they live and actually build up a profile. You can't just go to their house and request all their data because you don't know their house. Uh, so it's, it's like a bit more old school police work. I agree, but it's not a formidable change. And, and the trend is that the law enforcement agencies are getting better. They are taking down the sites. Um, and then the question I also get, aren't you destroying the dark net by mapping it? Uh, sorry. Uh, and, and my answer to that is no, because basically, <laughs> It was never designed to be dark. Uh, that's a misconception. It was only designed to be not being able to be geolocated. But, and that's a very big difference. Um, and the most thing that we, we found useful for cyber threat intelligence or open source intelligence from Darknet is the password. Because they're being sold and resold. And we buy all these dump files for bitcoins and, and index them. So basically, we have now indexed over 7.5 billion password hashes. Um, and that's interesting because you can use them uh, in new type of attacks. For instance, if you buy personal information about people where they live, you can do really, really good uh, cyber attacks with the data that you have from uh, the darknet. This is an example. Um, this is an old uh, hash file. And we find these and index these new every day, yes? How many storage do you use for your research? How much storage? Yeah. Uh, well, we, we're running it on, on Elasticsearch clusters that are in the terabytes. Um, so we, we have some Elasticsearch clusters where we index all this. Uh, there are a couple of terabytes, but the darkness isn't that big. That, that's the whole point. People think that it's like huge. It's like bigger than the internet. But it's not. It's like really, really small. So I think we have like a 10 terabyte server uh, where we host this on. So it's not, not terrible. How much of your database is present in Troyeskan database? Sorry, what was the question? How much of your hash database is present in Troyeskan database? Um, everything is present. Uh, in, the question was how much of your data is present in, in uh, Troy's research? I think Troy actually have probably more data than us because people are more likely to send him data because he's more well known. Uh, we have some other data sources. We send some stuff to him. If we find some stuff uh, that is not on there, we send it to have our been pwned. But we have access to the raw data, which is very interesting uh, because this is what the hackers do as well. Uh, because you can cross-reference one hash file against another hash file. And the scary thing is, I found myself seven times in our database. Like, and I'm, I'm like an old school hacker that I'm really careful about passwords. I found my passwords cracked three times uh, and, and hashed seven times. Uh, and it's actually, if you were to do a search on most security professionals, you would find yourself at least a couple of times in these dump files. Uh, and the scary thing is, uh, since you have like clear text password, if you have this from enough dump files, you can make a lot of assumption on how someone creates the password. So like the takeaway uh, from this is don't create password. Use a password manager. That's the only way to be secure. Um, 
because we had a couple of attacks coming from which we cross-referenced this spring um, sorry this December there was a lot of our customers that were hacked uh, by, by a spear phishing campaign where they had like cross-reference a couple of these dump files figured out people's password then used the zero day in Microsoft 365's uh, two-factor authentication and a lot of our clients actually paid money because th they were so well made uh, because they had research from, from various dump files of Apollo.io and LinkedIn where they worked that they were in CFO position and then they had hacked other to figure out their passwords so they mailed like this we know that IBM works with this company so they, they cross mail like make this payment between different CFOs and large companies and a few of our clients actually paid even though we said to IT this is ongoing probably shouldn't but so, so this is the new really big threat that we see uh, with the darknet that now because when I started as a hacker like 20 years ago, so then people were like, oh, back then it was Hotmail. Oh, can you hack my girlfriend's Hotmail account? I was like, no, it's too much work. Now I'm like, yes, I could, but I won't do it. <laughs> because I probably have her password like seven times. So <laughs> yes, I could hack her Hotmail again if someone actually uses Hotmail. <laughs> Um, the question was regarding two-factor authentication. Can you hack someone even though you have two-factor authentication? Yes, most uh, authentications nowadays is based on SS7, which is like SMS text. And there is, uh, there was actually a darknet site where you could buy a virtual service provider. Uh, so you get access to the SS7 network uh, in bitcoins. Um, so people were selling SS7 network because then you could reroute someone's text messages if you have their phone number. And on a lot of the sites, you also register your phone number. So if you have your phone number and your password, then if you have a what's called a SS7 access, uh, which there is a hacking groups that does nowadays, that's what we've been seeing lately. It's a trend that they have been doing SS7 access. So uh, security advice number two: change your two-factor authentication to like Google Authenticator or some token-based authentication. That's still not hackable. <laughs> YubiKey, definitely, it's a good advice. Um, other things you can buy uh, on the darknet is like scanned passport, sports, and the latest trend as well. Like this is from a coffee lunch table in Korea, where so someone is, just goes there and swipes everyone's uh, fobs, security fobs via RFID, and sells the clones on the darknet. So you can buy like them for any company you want. We found that, it's quite funny. So you like not only passport scans or personal information. And these keys are normally also encoded with the employee ID and sometimes name and the access codes to the building. Uh, so you can buy them online. That can be useful, I guess. How expensive? Um, <laughs> how expensive? They're, they're, they're quite expensive, actually. They, these scans, uh, they're like $100 plus. Uh, so, so they're hundred dollar plus. So it's like much, much more expensive than just a card number. Um, and, and basically, also what the, the hackers are doing is trying to guess your password not by cracking it, because if you crack one in one dump file, and then you have the clear text saying that my password is password, then you can cross reference that to all the other data that you have. And then you can guess like 90% of the passwords for all the people. So even if your password isn't leaked, the probability that some hacker has already de figured out your password based on clear text versus hashes in different dump files is quite big. Um, so basically what we're seeing is uh, new attacks, which is basically old attacks. Uh, but people are talking about password stuffing or turkey stuffing, which is basically just password reuse, where like people find your hacked uh, account somewhere or buys it, uh, figure out how you normally create your password. There is actually a researcher want to do like apply machine learning to this, so like feed in all your password in and guess your next password. Uh, that, that's another research topic I'm probably going to do. Um, so what we see in trends is. Law enforcement is taking sites down, 
but they're always going for the biggest one and the most scary ones, um, which leads to that people are moving. I mean, they take down one side of town. The good thing with the di distributed network like Tor is you can't take down that thing because you don't know where the service is unless you actually someone does a mistake like server configuration or opsec mistake. You can't actually take down the server because you don't know where it is. So you have to actually do proper police work, and that means it takes a lot of time to infiltrate a site well enough to be able to take it down. Yes. Why aren't they like targeting these bulletproof hosts? Sorry, what was the question? Why aren't they? Targeting uh, the hosting. Companies. They they are targeting the hosting companies. Uh, I mean, if the hosting companies, there there has been a couple of times where they're taking down large uh, both hosting providers. And then hundreds of sites have gone down. But, but one big reason why they don't do that, if the police authorities can hack one site, then they'd rather stay on that server, which are hosting all the other 100 sites, to actually get information gathering before taking them down. Uh, and, and then again, same thing is like when the Pirate Bay got down, they, they shut down the whole service by and took everyone's service. You can't actually do that anymore, because technically that's not illegal. Because it, 80% of the content, content on the darknet might be legal. So if you take down a bulletproof hosting provider, you're always taking down someone else's legal services. So nowadays, you actually have to prove that the services provided are illegal. Not just hosting a site on tour is not illegal per se. So if you were to take down an entire hosting provider based on that, that's unlawful in both UK law and US law currently. Um, but it is a cumbersome and slow process. And what we're seeing is um, that most people that do get caught uh, get caught because of bad operational security uh, or and or server misconfiguration. Uh, so most of the sites that have been seized lately, that's given another trend that people are actually moving to smaller and smaller sites. Uh, so because the problem is, I think it was very nice when we had like only three big market sites to monitor that made my life much easier because there I could buy everything that I wanted. Uh, but nowadays, it's like for every site that gets taken down, people are getting more and more careful and switching to smaller and smaller sites. So the trends that we're seeing is like most of the sites now have captures all the time because, yeah, we don't want them to be automatically scraped. There's a lot more invite only. You have to build up reputation. Uh, the dark is getting darker in that way. That's like you have to like be invite only and solve the captcha and do a lot more work to actually get into the community uh, communities that are illegal. Um, and the problem with, with this is like it, it's a many-headed hydra. For every site you take down, two more pops up. Uh, so it's like you, the police is currently trying to cut off the heads. That's just the biggest one that has gotten like media attention. And then everyone that couldn't buy their cocaine from Silk Road is going to buy it from somewhere else. And the guys that couldn't buy their exploit pack from exploitpack.com or the Onion is going to go to the next site and set up a new site. So we're seeing a lot more boutique sites, smaller sites that don't attract media attention uh, with, with a smaller, more niched following. So instead of having like the big sites that you know you're going to be targeted by the feds, you sort of like people are starting to run smaller operations um, and trade only what they're really good at. So that's really a trend now. How does that affect companies like yourself who are monitoring these and making the life a lot harder for you? It, it makes their life harder. Uh, also, it is. It captures and, and find new places. Yeah. If new sites are coming up and staying up for, say, a day or two, how do you identify the new site in time to get onto it? Um, well, it's like most of the sites that only go up a day or two is too ephemeral for us to actually have any good trade because you actually have to build up. And it's like they have to do marketing as well. This is like, yes, it's cybercrime, but still, it's like you still have to have a marketing budget and do spamming or you actually get a followers or, or like get enough people to talk about your market on Reddit. So most of the sites are actually interested, like they will be on Reddit. <laughs> it's like, th there's a Reddit channel called uh, r slash onions, where everyone market their darknet sites. 
Uh, and I guess they have a lot of requests from law enforcement to like, can I get the IP list of whoever is posting in this channel, please? Uh, because it's like, that's how I will get them if they're doing a new, like, very legal site. Uh, go to Reddit and ask who posted where. <laughs> Uh, so if they're smart enough, they'll get someone to pay. Yeah, I mean, they probably paid someone in another country to post on Reddit. But yeah, most of the sites nowadays are actually, I mean, you need to link them from the clearnet because, uh, and Tor has a new uh, release as well, where the addresses is going to be, or are like 64-bit bombs. <coughs> they're super long. No one can actually remember them at all. They've gone from like 60-bit to 64-bit in new release. Um, so now you really have to have a link. Uh, more or less. There is the ways to scrape them from memory if you're running nodes, um, because the nodes obviously need to have all the addresses of all the nodes on the network. It's a distributed hash table, but if you run enough nodes, you can scrape them from memory uh, and get them. That's how we get them. And that's probably how much law enforcement get them as well. Uh, so we, we will know whenever a new site pops up. Um, so yes, that basically follows the questions like how is that making our life harder? Well, we actually have to do more work uh, to actually be able to monitor this in a serious way because we have to create soft puppet accounts. We need to communicate with the uh, community. And a soft puppet account is like a literal term for like soft puppet accounts uh, where you, you create fake accounts that are good enough to like fake that you're an online hacker that's 17 years old. Um, and, and they do have an ICQ. Most of the hackers, they, they have ICQ because they're Russian. Five digits or two or more? What? Five digits only, right? Five, no, it's not five digits ICQ account. Those sell for a lot of money. Five digits ICQ account. You, you get hundreds of dollars for those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pe people like the old school ICQ account. Um, and, and you have to have a Jabber address, and you have to have a PGP key, and you need to set up a user that looks realistic um, to actually register on these sites. And then we register on enough sites to actually have credibility that if someone starts checking you out, it's like, huh, who's this user? Ah, he posted two years ago. So you need to, so we actually have people that just registers accounts uh, to actually build credibility on these sites. Um, and a lot of the invites. A lot of these sites nowadays is invite only. And you can normally buy them on other forums. So like there's trading forums to buy invites to other forums. <laughs> That's a new trend as well. So you can pay in Bitcoin and buy invites to other hacking sites or crime sites or drug running sites. Um, and normally th this is our OPSEC for our analysts. And, and also we do this for law enforcement. Uh, keep posting and interactions to minimum. We try to like buy access into rather than interact with people too much because every time you interact with someone, there's a chance that you will fail your object. You want the bad guys to fail the object, not your analysts. <laughs> so that's uh, uh, when posting in forums. Remember time difference. There's a lot of like opsec stuff that you need to get right. That's why interactions is is generally bad because every time you talk to someone, you can slip up. Uh, as much as they do. Uh, and also, if you're going to do this research, remember that these are professional criminals, so you don't want to slip up on your OPSEC. You don't want them to know that you're working for someone else and you live somewhere. That's a really bad idea. Um, so that's, and every post you make leaves a mark. I mean, as we discovered, the darkness is not that dark. Everyone can access it very easily and see what you do. And how we normally find people, and we've been doing investigations uh, for many people, is that people password reuse again. We, we help with uh, some um, child exploitation work to find some, some uh, child photography sites. And in one of the dumps that we found from one of those sites, 22% of the users had reused the same password on the child pornography site on the darknet as they had in public accounts. 22%. Uh, so people are stupid, yes. Uh, am I stupid? Yes. Have I reused password? Yes. Am I currently doing it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I learned my lesson. But it's like, so literally 22% of the sites we, we got in to other people's accounts on, on like with the same username and password. 
uh, as in public dumps. Uh, and that's a not. Okay, questions and answer. One question there. Uh, how are you buying dumps of the carbon? <coughs> How are we buying? That's an interesting what? question. Yes, we are. No, exactly. Most of the most of the times, that, that's a question. Is it is it is it a good thing to buy dumps off the dark web? It's probably. Uh, second of all, is it legal? Yes, it is legal. Uh, apparently, because it's already most of these dump files are already public. Most of the times we don't buy it. Most of the time we say we want to buy it, give us a sample. Uh, most of the time it's enough uh, to say that you want to buy a dump file to get the sample. If you get the sample, you can do uh, a lot of research against have I been pwned, against other sources, is this legit, is it from the right site, uh, working together with a client. Um, so most of the times the, the truth is we don't buy it. Uh, we say that we're interested in buying it, Sometimes we have to buy because we have to have a credibility that we are a buyer of dump files. Uh, but most of the times we don't have to buy them because they will give you a free sample uh, or, or for a very small fraction, uh, big enough so you can actually do statistical verification because 90%, as I said, fraud <laughs> is the easiest crime, right? So it's, like it's easier to take the, the dump file from LinkedIn and say, oh, I hacked xyz.com, I'm selling you the dump file. Um, and, and how do you actually verify that? Well, you have to have access to all the other dump files, and that's why nowadays no one buys a dump file uh, without actually giving samples. They're statistically big enough that you can prove that it's a new dump. So when you have bought dump files then, has it been worth it? Um, have you managed to do more good with it? Than um, depends. It's like normally we, we are asked to buy dump files from when a client have had a breach, they they might want to see that they actually have a breach. When was the breach? Um, I would say no, because if no one buys this dump file, someone is going to buy this dump file. Uh, someone is going to repost it, and there's like a value chain of dump files. First, they come out very expensive, and then they're resold, and then they're traded on IRC, and then they're traded again, and then they come out for like a couple of quid. So we normally buy them. For indexing, if, we, if it's a file that we've known for a couple of months, then we know they're going to be relisted very much more cheap. And we, then we can buy it for like a hundred bucks. Yes, then it's definitely worth it to, to add to our database. If it's like thousands and thousands, no, it's not going to be worth it because this data will leak and they're criminals and they're going to like reuse it as many times as possible. And, and it eventually will be available for free and paste, and paste it. Yes. Uh, we only work with with uh, private sector uh, currently, because I guess most public sector has their own law enforcement doing very similar things. What's your sweet spot for HSD creating a number of nodes? Like how many nodes are you kind of hitting in order to get good reliable coverage of the HSD creating? We have a couple of hundred nodes. Um, it, it's enough. Yeah. Uh, Time 60 was a sweet spot, we're running, because it depends on geography as well, and, and with the new tour release, uh, they, they have made it harder, so you need a couple of hundred nodes to, uh, to get good. What's your favorite thing to see in, in the dark web? What's my favorite? Yeah, or even the, the scariest one, if the, I don't know if the uh, audience is suitable. Well, uh, actually, the, the scariest thing is uh, some of these paste sites where they put a price on someone's head, like physical threats, uh, where they post like your picture, where your children go to school, um, that really scares me. Because mm -hmm. the, the, when people are moving from the digital cybercrime world into like physical threats uh, and say, please kill this person or kidnap his kids, and here's his kid's school address, that makes me really uncomfortable. Do you ever report to the individuals who are their founders? Like, do you ever contact law enforcement? Uh, yes, we, but when it comes to child abuse, for instance, that we report, we have a feed into uh, both uh, European and US law enforcement where we report new sites that we find that are 
definitely uh, uh, child abuse sites uh, and also some of the more severe physical threats uh, we do report but we don't report anything else but th there we have like a like do I feel good going to bed having found out this out without reporting it but it's, it's also like a, I, I think it's the right thing to do uh, in, yeah uh, one quick other one. Uh, do you guys do exit node analysis and... No, we don't do any exit node analysis at all. I think that's, like, we, I like the Tor project. I think it's a great project. I, I think that's, like, I don't want to monitor people as per se. I mean, it's like, I'm not interested in, in, in mass monitoring. The only reason I was interested was us this year. We experimented with like the bandwidth manipulation stuff to affect the actual running of the network as a, as a whole, like the like the spring traffic and force traffic in particular directions. Um, yeah, I mean th there is cer certain attacks you can do against the Tor network, but that's basically not what we're trying to do. We we just trying to map the, the the web and not like mess with the Tor network. I think the Tor network is a great invention. I don't want to mess with it. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. You've been a great audience. It's been a long time. <laughs>